What's up everybody, Dr. Ryan here. Today we're talking about lupus perineal and sarcoidosis. Thanks for joining me. As always, we have a lovely clinical case. You are seeing Mr. Sace, <laughs> a 55-year-old white man with sarcoidosis. So he is known with it. He ran out of prednisone about two months prior to seeing you. And apart from some constipation, he feels otherwise well. However, the metabolic panel reveals a corrected calcium of 3 millimole per liter. You know that sarcoidosis can indeed be associated with hypercalcemia. Now, which of the following is a correct mechanism for the sarcoidosis associated hypercalcemia? <laughs> is it A, direct granulomatous involvement of the axial skeleton causing liberation of calcium from the bone? Or is it B, direct stimulation of uh, increased calcium absorption from the gut? Is it C, increased parathyroid hormone production? D, increased production of our beloved 1,25 dihydroxycholic acephorol vitamin D? Or is it E, increased production of 25 hydroxy vitamin D? <laughs> I wonder. Here's some beautiful pictures, courtesy of shock case in the clinical medicine. God bless you guys. Lupus perneal. It's a violaceous lesion. It's a patch that we can see on the nose. And here as well, with some hyperpigmentation of their cheeks. All right. Um, so what are the signs of lupus perneal? Commonly the tip of the nose, as we have seen, but however, may occur on the cheeks, the earlobes, the hands, and the feet. What is a differential diagnosis for lupus perineal? Ah, that lesion looked kind of like the butterfly rash of systemic lupus erythematosus. But the classic way to differentiate these is that SRE will spare the nasal folds. Lupus perineal can involve it. Right, rosacea as well is a common differential for both lupus perineal and the butterfly rash of SRE. Rhinophyma, lupus vulgaris, and leprosy. Okay, guys, what really is sarcoidosis and what are the causes? Well, sarcoidosis is a multi-systemic granulomatous. Those are the two terms you need to appreciate. Multi-systemic and granulomatous disease of unknown etiology. Nobody knows where it comes from. Nobody knows why it's there, but it's there. It's characterized by non kc eating granulomata of different organs. We noticed that, uh, pathologically speaking, there is an imbalance between subsets of T-lymphocytes and disturbance of our cell-mediated immunity. So it renders you kind of like immunosuppressed, doesn't it? Histologically, there are granulomas similar to TB, but the thing is that there's no cheese. There's no cheese here. There's no caseation. Those mm, tasty cheddar, yes. Mention clinical examinations in sarcoidosis. So we said that it is multi-systemic and it is granulomatous, right? So starting off with the skin, there's a lot of integumentary changes, uh, notably erythematosum, uh, plaques on the skin, macular papular rash, the lupus perneal we spoke of, hypo and or hypopigmentation, subcutaneous nodules. You can also have generalized lymphadenopathy, right? Um, you have your paraspinomegaly, right? So involvement of the reticular endothelial system. Lungs, 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 lungs. For sarcoidosis falls under the domain of the pulmonologist because it causes fibrosis or interstitial lung disease. And we'll talk about the radiological classification later on. Can involve the eyes where it can cause conjunctival nodules, uveitis, and lacrimal gland involvement. It can also cause bilateral parotidomegaly and a whole host of neurological findings. Okay, so you got a patient. Do you think the patient has sarcoidosis? What history do you want to take? Is there fever? Is there arthritis or arthralgia? And has there been a cough with associated dyspnea? And you probably want to grade that dyspnea as per the NYHA classification. What is our beloved Lofgren syndrome? It uh, refers to a very specific entity. Inside sarcoidosis is the presence of three things, erythematosum, polyarthralgia, and bihyalia adenopathy. Now this is so specific in the context of sarcoidosis that you don't even require a biopsy to pathologically prove that the patient has sarcoidosis if you have this particular constellation of clinical features. Wow, Lofgren. Here for it, we have this question. What is Hirfurth syndrome, also known as uveo parotid fever? That's a claim to fame, right? Uveo parotid fever. It occurs in sarcoidosis and refers to the presence of these four things. Fever, bilateral parotidomegaly, anterior uveitis, and a lower motor neuron seventh pulse A. Okay, how do you want to investigate someone in sarcoidosis? So first up, good to start with your hematological investigations, your full blood count, and your erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So you're going to have a lymphopenia in sarcoidosis with a high ESR, which speaks to the inflammatory state of this multisystemic granulomatous condition, right? Mantu tests are differentiated from TB. Notice that in sarcoidosis, the Mantu test is negative. The Mantu test is negative. And serum calcium and gamma globulin, both are going to be high. 
X-ray of the chest speaks to what we call the scatting classification, radiologically speaking. We'll talk about that, but basically you want to look out for bihilar lymphadenopathy, lung infiltration, pulmonary fibrosis, mullery mottling, and eggshell calcification. You're going to do an X-ray of the hands and feet, and you find that cysts may be found in the phalanges. Other investigations, X-ray of the kidneys may show nephrocalcinosis, not always. A high resolution CT of the chest for our beloved interstitial lung disease or the medicata has changed now to diffuse from one day. Uh, lung disease, right? Uh, you can do a lung function test uh, for restrictive lung disease uh, and you also may find a diminished uh, diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide, DLCO, right? Uh, on your liver function, these are usually abnormal and if you broke the patient, what you can find is a cobblestone appearance of the mucosa and biopsy will definitely show your non-KCH in granulomata. Other investigations is a bronchiviolar lavage, which will demonstrate our increased CD4 to CD8 T-cell ratio together with increased neutrophils in the setting of pulmonary fibrosis. All right. Uh, if you do a lung biopsy, uh, and histologically speaking, you're going to see features of interstitial lung disease and diffuse parenchymal lung disease. And this lung biopsy, there's many ways to cut it. <laughs> Transbronchial, percutaneous, open uh, lung biopsy or video uh, assisted thoracoscopic biopsy, so called VETS biopsy, right? If you do a fine needle aspirate or biopsy from another involved site, and that site can be a lymph node, a skin nodule, liver, or lacrimal gland, you're going to find those classic non cheesy granulomata. It's not very changed, eh? <laughs> Others, of course, is the serum angiotensin converting enzyme, SACE level, which is indicative of active sarcoidosis, but it's not helpful in diagnosis, right? It's helpful in monitoring disease activity, but not helpful for diagnostic purposes. A gallium scan of the lung will show an abnormal diffuse uptake already. So now, we were alluding to this earlier. What are the different radiological stages of sarcoidosis? Well, there's four of them to mention as per what we call the scudding classification, scudding. Stage one is bihilar adenopathy, usually symmetrical, maybe paratracheal. It's uh, usually resolved spontaneously within a year. Stage two is a little bit more involved, where we have bihilar adenopathy together with peripheral parenchymal pulmonary infiltrates, often diffuse, and once again, spontaneous resolution is the name of the game. Stage three is where you have the diffuse pulmonic infiltrate without the bihilar adenopathy. And stage four is where you have, oh dear, pulmonary fibrosis. The patient complains of cough and dyspnea with progressive ventilatory failure. And inevitably, you're going to get raised pulmonary pressures, pulmonary hypertension, and core pulmonary supervening. X-ray may show extra calcification. How does this look, radiologically speaking? There's a scanning classification. Stage one, as we see, is your bilateral hyalad the front and center, guys, front and center, but notice it's normal lung parenchyma. Stage two, scanning, is where you have the hyalad with the pulmonic infiltrates. Stage three is where you kind of lost the bihyalad but you got the pulmonic infiltrates. Stage four is, oh dear, pulmonary fibrosis with the dyspnea. <sighs> oh dear. How do you want to treat sarcoidosis? If it's acute with erythema nodosum, basically bed rest with non steroidals may suffice. Steroids if the patient has severe symptoms, especially the dyspnea, spontaneous resolution usually occurs. But if the disease is not improved six months post diagnosis, then you really want to consider prednisone. Start it off with a dose of 30 mg daily for six weeks, and you gotta tape with this prednisone, right? You don't want to inhibit your natural hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis, and that's the reason why we gotta tape it off. And you can't just stop it because then you end up with a problem in terms of suppression of that axis, right? So you would ideally you start at 30 milligram daily for six weeks, then you reduce to alternate days, uh, 15 milligrams for six to 12 months, right? Other treatments we can offer in sarcoidosis, if there's uh, predominant skin involvement or prominent skin involvement, avoid strong sunlight. As you know, this may precipitate hypercalcemia because of the increase of vitamin D and renal impairment. Topical steroids for that UV axis, inhaled corticosteroid will help with the lungs. Chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, low dose thalidomide in cutaneous sarcoid. But remember, thalidomide was not good because it was associated with teratogenicity and it causes focomelia. Oh dear. Right? In severe cases of sarcoidosis, you can use a steroid sparing agent in the way of methotrexate, 10 to 20 milligram weekly, or our beloved azathioprine, 50 to 100 milligram daily. Uh, sometimes severe cases, there's role for a TNF blocker. Our good friends, infliximab, citalizumab, pego, adalinumab, golimumab, etanacept, but infliximab is a go-to guy in most instances. Single lung transplantation in selected cases. Refer to the pulmonologist for that. Now, what are indications for steroids in sarcoidosis? That's the big buzzword in sarcoidosis. 
So if your patient has severe symptoms like erythematosum, fever, arthritis, peroncomal lung disease in any form, be it the bihilar adenopathy, the pulmonic infiltrates or the fibrosis, vital organ involvement, especially involvement of the eyes, CNS, heart to kidneys, and of course hypercalcemia. What's the prognosis in sarcoidosis? Mortality is some 1 to 5%. Death is usually due to cardiac involvement. So the cardiac involvement, usually it manifests as heart block, right? But it can masquerade as other involvement uh, as well. Pulmonic fibrosis, co-pulmonary, renal damage. Uh, I mentioned some poor prognostic features in sarcoidosis. So uh, generally it's worse in the younger folks, in the age less than 40. Persistent symptoms for over six months, so chronicity of the symptoms. In multisystemic involvement, if you have more than three organs involved. If you've got lupus perneo together with stage three or four, scatting radiologically. And somehow it's worse among the Afro-Caribbeans. So back to our clinical case, you have Mr. Say, 55-year-old Caucasian gentleman. He's known with sarcoidosis. He ran out of his prednisone. He's otherwise well. But he has marked hypercalcemia of 3 millimolar per liter. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when they come for you? The reason he has this is because of increased elaboration of our beloved 1,25 dihydroxycholecalciferol vitamin D. So hypercalcemia and or hypercalciuria occurs in about 10% of sarcoidosis patients. We find that it's more common among the Caucasian men. The mechanism is said is, uh, you know, increased production of 1,25 dihydroxy vitamin D by the actual granuloma itself, which then serves to increase intestinal absorption of calcium. And hence we have hypercalcemia but with a suppressed PTH, which is different from the situation in hyperparathyroidism when the parathyroid gland does not even listen to the circulating calcium level in the blood. Increased exogenous vitamin D from the diet or sunlight exposure may exacerbate this problem. You don't want to bring in that vitamin D that brings in more calcium. You may have malignant calcification. Watch out. Sedum calcium should be determined as part of the initial evaluation of all sarcoidosis patients. Beloved, please allow me to share with you from scripture this morning. We're going to talk about acknowledging the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 32 to 33, Jesus gives us a promise. He says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will also disown before my Father in heaven. Like Paul said, and I quote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation of those who believe. Salvation is only available through the name of Jesus Christ. So tells us John chapter 14, verse 6 and John eleven twenty five. 25. There's only one name given under heaven by which men are saved. And that name is the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll put your hope and trust in him and you will be known and acknowledged by the Lord Jesus in heaven one day. God bless you. Have yourself a wonderful day. I'll catch you soon with another video in internal medicine. God bless you.